And now, the After Action Review with Rod Rodriguez. And welcome to the After Action Review podcast. I'm Rod Rodriguez. Separating from military service under the best conditions is stressful and can make you think really hard about the journey you've taken so far. When the conditions of your separation aren't ideal, it's really easy to become angry and embittered with your service. Some people will turn their back on the military and go on with their lives, while others become consumed with the feeling that they were abandoned by an organization they gave so much to. Chuck Luther found himself in a similar dilemma, a decision to make about how he was going to live his life post forced separation from the Army. To walk away without looking back, or to look closer at the problem and try to make a difference. We start in Killeen, Texas, a military town outside of Fort Hood. Had a conversation I got a phone call the other night when I was at Walmart in Harker Heights from a Crystal City DC number and I answered it and the guy on the other line said um can I speak to Sergeant Luther? Well, I can tell you this, Rod. Anytime somebody calls for Sergeant Luther, um, it's probably not going to be a good call. So I'm like, uh, who's calling? He said this is Secretary Mattis. We talked a little bit. He said, I saw, you know, somebody just came to my office and said, hey, you need to go to disposalboard.org and look at this. He said, I've heard your case. I've seen it through the Senate. You know, I've seen all the interviews. I've read the transcripts. It's on, I didn't realize this. Maybe I'm just naive, but, you know, when I testified in Congress, that's a part of the historical record. Now, you can go back and look at it at any time. It's a part of the written record. I'm like, wow. And he said, so I think you got a raw deal. I think you could have handled a little bit better being an NCO. And he keeps on he's critiquing me. I'm like, okay, cool. So I started to talk and not think. I just, he asked the question and I wanted to expound on it. I get a little long-winded sometimes. Well, between you and I, in the middle of conversation, he said, Sergeant, hey, Sergeant, shut the fuck up and listen. And I was like, okay, so when General Mattis tells you to shut the fuck up and listen, you probably should. So I did. I said, yes, sir. And he said, okay. Um, so, hey, so... This is what you need to do. He said, don't do a bunch of CNN damn interviews. Don't get pulled in that arena. Keep your nose clean. Keep fighting because I think you have a tremendous ability to help a tremendous amount of men and women. I will support you. So I'm Chuck Luther. I'm the founder and president, um, executive director of DisposableWarriors.org, a, a veterans national nonprofit. Disposable Warriors started off as a, uh, a veterans advocacy group to help with discharge advocacy, educating people on how to upgrade their types of discharges if they feel they were wrongfully discharged, things of that nature. We did that for about seven years, and just recently in the last three years, we started three other campaigns that incorporate four facets of Disposable Warriors. We do a, uh, a project called Project 22, which is veteran suicide awareness and prevention. The second um, program that we run is called Operation Grit. Um, what that is is a veteran homelessness initiative. The uh, third program that we run is a program called No One Left Behind. It's headed up by program manager, uh, Major Jason Norwood. He's an active duty major on Fort Hood. who's a resiliency commandant there at the resiliency campus. Him and a police officer, a friend of his, we've urged into the Killeen Police Force here locally. And what we've done is we've created an environment to teach officers how to de-escalate the situation when they come to a veteran in crisis or a bit, as we call them, that's having a mental health issue. Uh, it could be financial, uh, marital, religious, whatever that issue is when the police officers get called to the disturbance and they come upon a veteran, an active duty soldier that's in crisis and mental health. Well, the last thing is the soldier advocacy group, which is the discharge advocacy, which I head up as the program manager. And that's just... If somebody feels they were wrongfully uh, separated from the service or a personality disorder or any of that nature, we dig in. We have a team of lawyers, um, military and civilian, that actually go through all the information, make sure the protocols, um, policies, and procedures were followed. Uh, if they were, then we educate the individual on what got them to where they're at and what their next step is, what we can do to try to help them move forward. If it wasn't uh, correctly done on the military side, 
we reach out and contact the department of the branch, whatever service it is, and we start the process of unwinding that to get that individual the proper discharge or, or whatever it needs to happen. Opposable warriors, basically it's a two-part thing. So, of course, warrior. we are all warriors. You know, I, I look back on my grandfather, Jack Luther, who served in the 82nd Airborne in World War II. I'm sorry, the, uh, the Screaming Eagles. He was a part of what I look at of that generation up to the Vietnam era. Those guys were soldiers, talking from the Army standpoint. Those were soldiers. I mean, those guys were the epitome of everything that we should strive to be. Um, they were men's men. They, you know, there wasn't there wasn't anybody that talked about the culture of where we're at now. You know, um, you see the rate of PTSD separations and discharges skyrocketing, and I don't know if it's a combination knowledge that we have now and people coming out and not being scared to ask for help or what it is, but either or, the old generation guys are soldiers. To me. We've become warriors. I believe right after Vietnam, I think the thing shifted and they created warriors. Warriors are, to me, we know our job, we're programmed to do our job and do it effectively and efficiently. And um, that's it, there's nothing else to it. We're just warriors, not necessarily soldiers. Those guys lived the motto, my grandfather, from the time he got out of World War II and got home to the time that he passed away back in the, uh, the late 80s. That guy was the epitome of a soldier. Unfortunately, nowadays we have guys that get out and guys that get out that when they get out, they live totally opposite of what we were in the military. So that's, I think that's where the distinction, so the warriors part kind of grabbed us and our generation of veterans, we like that warrior spirit, you know, you know, we're warriors this, warriors that, we just fight, we fight, we don't give up. My personal um, uh, situation that I had with the military being separated with under a personality disorder in the middle of combat during the surge in Taji, Iraq in 2007, I felt disposed of. I felt like the military as a whole wanted to dispose of me, expeditiously get rid of me so that they could put another person to fill a spot because we needed boots on the ground because we were in the middle of the surge. The war is at its height. I mean, we were in the Dial of Providence. Um, you know, it, it was just really bad. We were taking heavy casualties. We were scouts, combat scouts, so we had to have bodies. There was no, we can't take this guy and put him on, on the rest for two weeks that mental health saying that he needs. So the best thing we can do is chapter uh, 5-13 personality disorder. It was an administrative type of separation, really no proof other than a social worker saying he has a pre-existing mental condition after 12 years of service. Take me back to uh, Fort, Fort Hood, Texas and separate me in 21 days and my whole career came to a screeching halt. So I found myself that I'd given everything to the military, uh, but I felt like none of it was given back to me. So I felt disposed of. I didn't want to be the poor pity me, so I started reaching out because I wanted to know if this was happening to everybody, if there was a problem with me, and then I uncovered uh, through Nation Magazine and Joshua Coors and a lot of investigative reporting that 6,000 times in a six year span this had happened. So we uncovered that, you know, unfortunately, um, leaders as a whole, and let me, this is my disclaimer, the Army and the Department of Defense they're the greatest organizations in the world, in my opinion. I love my army. I would never, ever disrespect that. Unfortunately, within an organization, you have people that lead. And unfortunately, people are prone to being toxic and bad. But no matter if they're leaders or not, just because they're in a position, they make judgment calls that they feel are the best. Unfortunately, when you uncover it all, it wasn't the best decision because they didn't realize how effective or defective it was going to be. So we found that there was a problem and we started fighting it. We had the, the, the procedure changed, the policy in the Department of the Army was changed in 2008 because of our testimony on who was allowed to separate with a 5-13. I had to go to the general of the military branch, not just the brigade commander, the battalion commander, or the post commander. So we did some good things. Uh, unfortunately, there are people in the military going to slip through the cracks and they have to get rid of them. But at 36,000 in six years, that was not slipping through the cracks. That's, that's where we came from. A lot of people see this Those of Orders as an organization that's just mad at the military because what happened to Chuck Luther, the guy that founded it, and they're just out to make a name for themselves and, and just crush everybody. Um, I worked for five years from 2011 to 2016, 
at Fort Hood, Texas as the Fort Hood Soldier Advocate under each of the three Corps Commanders, which our current Chief of Staff in the Army was my boss here from Millie. So I became a part of the solution and not a part of the problem. And so is it angry? Disposable Orders isn't angry so much nowadays. We're angry that men and women, young men and women will come in the military and they will lay down everything and their families put aside their lives to sacrifice, to keep our country free and who we are. But to be thrown away, it's just not right. So we try to do get in there and, and make sure that if they're trying to throw them away, we help correct it. Maybe they don't understand what they're doing isn't the best best method to separate this individual. You know, and that's where we get an opportunity to train military leaders that, hey, hey, you know, policy says this, maybe you didn't see that dentum. Or the amendment to the to the policy, you can use this and you can send them over to the, to the, wounded, uh, the WTU, you can send them to the triad matrix where you have a bunch of doctors and leaders that really look at the case and say, this person needs to be medically separated, not administratively separated. So no, we're, we're not angry. We just decided that that was the name that fit um, because there are a lot of angry people this happens to. And we want to make sure that angry person doesn't start turn into the statistic of uh, suicide, homelessness, or Lord forbid, unfortunately, we see it quite often. It's scary that we can actually when we hear the news, we, we don't shock like we used to that a soldier's turned his gun on somebody within the ranks. I think the culture has a large part of why we're dealing with the, the PTSD, and I think the 25% of that the other quarter is that I think we have a lot more medical technology to completely understand what's going on and where this PTSD comes from. I think there was a, as much PTSD in Vietnam, World War I, World War II, as there is today, maybe even more, but I think it's just the the culture of the individuals, how we're we're cradled and we're coddled. Um, you know, everybody's going to be okay. The participation trophy kind of thing, where we just don't know how to handle. It. Regardless of whatever commander um, made the decision to wrongfully use a type of separation for whatever reason they chose to. And for holding that on, um, onto it, I, I realized that anger was just going to keep exacerbating the problems that I had. For a while, when they said PTSD, I said, no, I don't. I don't have a problem everybody else did. But then I realized that once you embrace that and you learn from it, it it's, not a, it's not a death sentence. You know, I, I educate young soldiers every day here in Florida, Texas, and around when they reach out to me when they're 11 Bravos and they get diagnosed with PTSD. They're like, I can't, you know, I can't take that diagnosis because they're going to kick me out of the military. I'm like, no, oh, just because you have PTSD doesn't mean that you're not serviceable or that you can't serve honorably and do your job. If anything, I think you can harness some of the, the deficits that it gives you and turn them into benefits of doing your job as a combat arms power and soldier um, in everyday life. So once I embraced it uh, and I realized, okay, I need to go to this therapy, I was never one for going to a counselor. I was like, I don't I don't need to be hugged and told everything's okay, but I realized it was more than that, and I started learning about myself and how the guy that went to Iraq was gone, and that guy wasn't coming back, but there's a there's a shell of what I used to be, so I had an opportunity to rebuild, take away the negative things that I had prior, and build on the good things and help people, and that's where I came to the conclusion when this of word was hatched is I want to help one person not go through this and to be able to sidestep it and continue on their military career. About five years ago, the nonprofit thing was like on fire. Like it's a veterans nonprofit. You know, America's still, you know, hungry to support the vets and this. Wounded Warrior was Wounded Warrior Project was founded and started within six months. Me and the gentleman that started that was a good friend of mine and he's no longer there by the way, but so we did this thing, and then somewhere around four years ago, and there was a lot of things that were starting to come out. I can tell you one thing about the nonprofit, veterans nonprofit um, arena. It is the most um, rewarding slash disgusting thing in the world that I've ever seen because I've seen organizations pop up, raise $20,000 in money, and um, it, it never go to veterans. I, there are multi-million dollar veteran nonprofits right now that I've seen their uh, their uh, 
P&L statements. I've seen their books, and I've seen that when you raise $300 million, but only 17.64% of that goes into direct veteran services like helping veterans, and that's why you exist. And the other 60-something percent is going into payroll and stuff. We have a problem with that. So the challenge was, how are we going to be different? Well, in our articles of incorporation and our bylaws, we've got it strictly written where no more than 20% of our overall income coming in will ever exceed in the payroll. So that means if we take $100,000 in, $20,000 of it is earmarked for payroll and operating. The rest is going to be generated in veteran services. And somebody said, well, how can you, how can you exist like that? Well, one, Kelly Floyd, my CEO, our CEO, and myself, who, who take a paycheck for the first time this year, in 10 years, disposable orders will have payroll. We've never had payroll. We've done it out of our own pocket. But that just tells me that, one, we don't take hundred, two hundred, and $300,000 a year salaries with expense accounts because that's not needed because we do it because we care. The second part of it is, is if we have to cover our expenses um, of payroll and keep us going to do these things, guess what we do? We work hard. We educate people on what we're doing. We prove to them that if they give a dollar to us, 75% of that dollar is going right into taking care of veterans. We're not going to strip it down so that we can drive nice cars and, and do good PR things. We want to help people. That's where it's at. So we say, uh, well, we got to raise more money. If we want, if we want to make a paycheck, we have to raise more money. And in turn, if we're raising more money, we're helping more people. So we kind of built that checks and balances system to get that from. So the challenge is in the community that we're in now is to get, get out in front of the people and tell them, hey, so if you give money to us, this is what it's going to be spent on. We're transparent. We open the books up for anybody. If we took $5,000 in the last week, you call me tomorrow and you say, you want to know where it was spent? I will send you a spreadsheet and I will show you exactly where it is. I have no problem doing that. None of us do. Find out what it is you want to do with the nonprofit. If it's uh, if it's feeding homeless veterans, if it's advocating at the congressional level, if it's creating a service dog organization to, to help offset costs or, or, or defer costs from veterans or the, the murky water that we have to go through with the government that says we'll pay for your service dog, but three years later they still have it and that individual's given up on it. So find out what it is. What is the passion? And then when you find the passion, make sure what's the reason why you want to do it. Um, if you're going to be a nonprofit, I believe firmly that you shouldn't be doing it for any kind of personal or financial gain. Uh, if that's the case, just just become a for-profit veteran-owned business. Use the Small Business Loan Association, get money for that, and move on. But the nonprofit side is a really unique uh, niche kind of thing. Like, so find out what you want to do, make sure it's the right thing to do, and then once you figure that out, look around you and find out is anybody else doing that, either nonprofit or or individually. They haven't established a nonprofit. Find out what your market is. One piece of advice I will give to every prospective nonprofit or veteran service type individual is help each other and help veterans. That's it. Bottom line. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what color you are, what sexual orientation you are, where you come from, what your rank was. It doesn't matter. It just matters that, hey, you need help because when we were in uniform, we die for each other there. And then it's like when we get back here and separate, we're out to kill each other or put each other down. So, the veteran service organizations out here and the nonprofits, like they're real catty. Like they don't, they don't outsource. We will outsource. If, if a veteran comes to me, for example, and needs help with something that's not in our toolbox, um, well, I'm going to start to learn about it because if that's an issue, then we need to learn the issues. But two, if I can't help that individual, I've networked with a ton of other nonprofits and veterans organizations that we can hand that person off to. And it's not that I'm giving up a veteran that I can say that I helped. It's that I can say that we help a veteran, and it's it's a community, it's a network, it's a brotherhood that you have to get in. So make sure that you're you're falling in that, and if you do become a nonprofit, be a part of that network, be a part of outsourcing to each other to be able to help for the common good. And even before you do the nonprofit, see if there's other nonprofit or prospective nonprofit people around you that can synergize with you to become one nonprofit. So what we did with uh, No One Left Behind, the other organization, uh, no, they were going to actually create their own nonprofit. We already created and we asked them, would you like to come and be a part of us? You don't have to incur the, the fees and the money and the time to get established. 
and uh, you can operate under us and independently and it's a plus plus you keep doing your mission and keep growing your mission by our footprint that we have and then two we actually can be a part of a great program to add to our toolbox to come home today me this veteran has brought the war home and my war is in my head and in trying to teach me how to reintegrate back into society so what are we going to do now well the nonprofits are going to be the uh, they're going to have an onus on them to support the mechanisms that the government puts out there because we know that not every government plan that's put out in place is going to work or they're going to strip it down as soon as they can so we try to police up our own you know the brotherhood of never leave a fallen comrade no one left behind that's kind of where we're at if you want to learn more about disposable warriors visit their website www.disposablewarriors.org and be sure to check them out on facebook at facebook.com slash disposable warriors They've also recently started a for-profit side of the business, so if you're looking for veteran apparel, check out Warrior Wear at their website, www.noapologytees.com. You'll find all these links attached to this episode. The After Action Review is heading back to the States in two more weeks, hopefully one more episode from Kuwait, and then the next time you hear from me, it will be from the land of the free and home of the brave. Thank you for continuing to support this podcast, but I need you to take one extra step in helping me to keep this podcast going. And that's by subscribing to this podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or through whatever app you listen to your favorite podcasts on. I'd also love to hear what you think about the show. Leave a review, and if you think we've earned it, a five-star review on iTunes. If your 9-to-5 job has you stuck in front of a computer that won't let you get to our, our website or your podcast app, I've got a workaround for you. Check out the podcast on YouTube. There, you'll find some videos of past interviews as well as the latest audio podcast you can listen to right there from YouTube on your Nipper computer. I'm Rod Rodriguez. Thank you again, and I'll see you at the next episode of the After Action Review Podcast.